So Lord, bless this time in your word this morning. Speak to our hearts, change us, mold us and shape us into the image of your son. And it's in his precious name we pray. Amen. It seemed good to Darius to appoint 120 satraps over the kingdom, that they would be in charge of the whole kingdom, and over them three commissioners, of whom Daniel was one, that these satraps might be accountable to them, and that the king might not suffer loss. And then this Daniel began distinguishing himself among the commissioners and satraps because he possessed an extraordinary spirit. And the king planned to appoint him over the entire kingdom. And then the commissioners and satraps began trying to find a ground of accusation against Daniel in regard to government affairs. But they could find no ground of accusation or evidence of corruption in as much as he was faithful. And no negligence or corruption was found in him. Good morning. Uh, it's very good to be with you here this morning at Forge Road Bible Chapel, and, and Zach and I are so excited uh, to get to, to speak with you and then and to open up God's Word and, listen, and to listen to it with you. Daniel 6 is a famous chapter, um, and it's famous in large part, um, a staple of Sunday school stories, because Daniel is about to go into the lion's den. But for our pur- purposes this morning, I would like to focus our attention on Daniel's character and his commitment to service. Daniel truly was a man of an extraordinary spirit. His integrity and his devotion to civil service was unmatched. And although he was a Jewish captive in a foreign land, he rose to power, uh, positions of power and authority that brought blessing not only to his own people, but to two major world powers in his day. And it is for that reason that it strikes me as incredibly odd that God would resign a man of such a caliber to to live his life serving two foreign peoples, two evil kingdoms. I mean, the Lord led him to be successful in everything that he did, interpreting dreams, um, giving counsel to these foreign governments, and even, as we read here, um, appointing him over the entire kingdom to govern it. Why would God not use a man of such a caliber as Daniel? Why would he not give him to Solomon to advise him, or or to Josiah, or, or to Hezekiah, to bless the people of Israel? Why would God give him to someone or to a kingdom that was not his own people, that was evil, the Babylonians and the Persians? Perhaps it is because in the counsels of God, Daniel who was enabled by his excellent spirit, was able to demonstrate who God is, to show a people who did not know who the true God of heaven was. It was because he was there, and they saw that true God of heaven through him. This morning, Zach and I would like to suggest that we are called to do the same, you and I. We are called to live a similar way of life in which the Lord Uh, calls upon our life to act with intentionality and purpose toward engaging the place that we find ourselves in, the community right here. Turn with me, if you would, um, to Jeremiah 29. Um, This chapter records a letter written by Jeremiah to uh, the Jewish exiles who are explaining, uh, and he's explaining in this letter how The Lord wants these exiles to live while they are in Babylon. And the Jewish exiles have been taken from their home uh, in Judah and led thousands of miles away to the land of Babylon. And at this time, in uh, 2 Kings chapter 24 tells us that there were 10,000 Jewish people who were exiled to Babylon. And I mean, the exile is one of the most uh, well-noted points in in, uh, Israel's history the, ba- the Babylonians had absolutely um, 
really taken so much from Israel. I mean, in, in that, in 2 Kings chapter 24, it tells us that most of the people that they took were their skilled workers, and they, and they left much of the poor people in Jerusalem. And, and so Babylon didn't just take their material wealth, they didn't just burn their cities and, and destroy, they, they also even took their best people. They took everything from them. And so this letter that we're going to read from in just a moment comes at a, one of the most depressing times in all of Israel's history. And with that in mind, let us read, starting in Jeremiah 29, verse 1. Now these are the words of the letter which Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem to the rest of the elders of the exile, the priests, the prophets, and all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had taken into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. And skipping down to verse 4. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon, Build houses and live in them. And plant gardens and eat their produce. Take wives and become fathers of sons and daughters. And take wives for your sons and give your daughters to husbands, that they may bear sons and daughters. And multiply there and do not decrease. Continuing on in verse 7. Seek the welfare of the city where I've sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf for in its welfare, you will have welfare. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let your prophets who are in your midst and your diviners deceive you and do not listen to the dreams which they dream for I have not sent them um, which I dream, for they uh, prophesy falsely to you in my name. I have not sent them, declares the Lord. For thus says the Lord, when 70 years have been completed for Babylon, I will visit you and fulfill my good word to you, and I will bring you back to this place. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for calamity, plans to give you a future and a hope. So despite the hopeful ending of this letter, consider with me how absolutely depressing this would have sounded to the people, to the exiles who first heard it. There were prophets at this time, who, false prophets, who were saying that the exile was going to end soon, God was going to come and deliver his people, and maybe within a few months or, or just a short number of years, they would be brought back home. And Jeremiah says, No, it's going to be 70 years. It's going to be, 70 years is a long time, right? Most of of our lifetimes are not much more than 70 years. And so this is is their whole life. Their whole life is going to be spent in a foreign land. Imagine, if you bear with me for a moment, that tomorrow... Dr. Anthony Fauci, we we were told that there was going to be a press conference held and that he was going to give an address to the nation. And, I mean, people are excited, right? They think if if he has news, that's uh, that's got to be a big deal, right? So everybody tunes in. It's national news. um, And everyone's wondering, I mean, is there going to be a breakthrough? Uh, Is there a vaccine that they're going to announce, some miracle drug? And then... He gets on television and he says, based on our research, based on um, the the findings of the scientific community, we unfortunately have to report there will be no vaccine. Um, There will be no herd immunity. In fact, we don't even have any miracle drugs or or any new therapeutics. Um, I'm really sorry to report, but Unfortunately, the the pandemic's going to last for quite some time. Um, It's going to last for 70 years. (laughs) And you would think, what? 70 years? Like, I was expecting to have family gatherings and have people over my house again without masks. And I was expecting to go to work, actually, for more than just one day a week. Or 
I mean, it, it, I was expecting to go to the Ravens game, but that's not going to happen. Um, it's actually not going to happen ever again for us. The Lord is not sending this message to depress them. The Lord is sending this message to focus them, to focus their time and their energy on the place that he has put them in, a community that they're going to be a part of, whether they like it or not, for the rest of their lives. The Lord does not tell them to stop living. Quite the contrary. He tells them to build houses and to plant gardens and to get married and even to plan on their kids having kids. The Lord doesn't tell them to withdraw from their community and become inward looking. He tells them to do the opposite. He tells them to seek the good of the city that they find themselves in and to pray for the people of that city. The, the Hebrew word welfare or good um, is translated shalom or, or literally peace. And so the Lord through Jeremiah is commanding that the people of God who are in exile pray for peace for a nation which has brought utter devastation upon their own people. I, I mean, it's incredible, you, you read later in Jeremiah, that when, um, when Nebuchadnezzar was, was laying siege to the uh, city of, of Jerusalem, and they, they, were able, they finally broke through, and I mean, they, they took the king of Zedekiah and, and, and blinded him, and they, they, they murdered his sons in front of, it, in front of his eyes. And I mean, the, the, cruel, the cruel nature of this is incredible, and, and does it really, I mean, does it make sense that God is asking his people to pray for peace for this nation? The Babylonians are their enemies, and for good reason. And so honestly, who is going to do this? Who is going to listen to the words of the prophet Jeremiah? Who is going to serve the city and pray for its captors? What is God doing, and does he really expect that his people are going to live this way? And well, there is one person, at least one person, who did. And uh, he was a man of an excellent spirit. A man who would do this, and do it so much so, that it would get him thrown into the lion's den. Because he did seek the good of the city. And he did great good to the enemies of God. And because he did pray for that city and pray for it three times a day, he did. Daniel was among the first wave of Jews who were brought from Jerusalem to Babylon. And so he was almost certainly in Babylon at the time when Jeremiah wrote this letter that we have recorded for us. And Daniel 9 makes it clear that he was both aware of Jeremiah's writings broadly speaking, and he was also specifically aware that Jeremiah was uh, foretold of the 70 years of captivity. Daniel would have actually heard this letter read, or perhaps even read it directly himself. And then he does exactly what Jeremiah says. He sought the good of the city by being a civil servant for over 60 years. What got him into the lion's den was his commitment to prayer, a time of prayer that I am sure involved prayers on behalf of the people that he served. Daniel had good reason to not want to serve these kingdoms. And yet God, uh, Daniel chose to obey God's commandment. He seeks the good and the peace of the city that he is in while not being of that city. In other words, he maintained his God, godly identity despite being involved in a godless society, a godless community. We, we are also called to be involved in our community, but to not live according to its corrupt standards. And we are called to know our neighbor and do life with them without being consumed with their way of life. We are called to be involved in government and law enforcement of our country without falling into the same self-serving, power-hungry tactics of so many human governments throughout history. We are called to act with justice in view and to treasure mercy and to walk with God in all of humility and not to walk with the gods of this world. Plainly put, 
the Bible teaches us to engage with our community as exiles, those who live in the world who maintain our identity and our distinctives. This is how Daniel was able to stay faithful to the Lord, and that is how we must also. I think a helpful way to think about our Christian lives is to identify with those who are in exile. And this is something Scripture actually does for us. In in Peter's first letter, he writes to persecuted Christians who are in exile, and they're scattered throughout the Roman Empire. And in the second chapter, verse 9, he reminds them that they are a chosen people, chosen out of the world. Um, And he tells them they are to shine the light of the Lord into a very dark place, as we see here. A place very much like the one that Jeremiah and Daniel found themselves in. And Peter goes on to encourage the believers in verse 11. He says, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. In other words, he's telling them that you are different and make sure that you live in this, in this manner. In Peter's letter, he is connecting his audience's social and political status in the Roman Empire to their spiritual existence on earth. Earlier in chapter 1, verse 17, Peter tells them to conduct yourselves, in the second part of this verse, conduct yourselves in fear during the time of your stay on earth. This language that Peter employs throughout this letter reflects a greater biblical theme of the people of God seeing themselves as those who are in exile. For example, um, in Psalm 39, verse 12, uh, King David writes, Hear my prayer, Lord, and listen to my cry for help, and do not be deaf to my weeping. I dwell with you as a foreigner and as a stranger, as all my ancestors were. The people of God... We are familiar with the state of living as strangers in our society. And this is still true of followers of Jesus today. Jesus explicitly prays to his father hours before going to the cross. He says, I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Essentially, But we, you and I, are living as exiles in our time and our place. But why does Jesus pray this way? And does he really expect that his people are going to live this way? As Christians, we do not engage in our communities because we want to make the world a better place. I don't think that Daniel or Jeremiah thought that being involved and serving the kingdoms of Babylon and later Persia was good for the world. And in fact, Jeremiah has a lot to say later on in chapters 50 and 51 about how Babylon will pay heavily for the sins that it committed. Instead, I think that they did this out of pure obedience to the Lord. And we are called to do the same, but with even greater understanding. We obey the commandment to seek the good of the city and to pray for its people because we believe that God will work through the relationships that we form with the people we live right around here to bring his salvation and to bring his kingdom into every corner of of Perry Hall and the world. God has pulled back the curtain and revealed to his church a great mystery in what he is doing in the world. And just the same way that he sent Daniel to Babylon, he has sent each one of us here to Perry Hall, Maryland and the surrounding area. He has given us a ministry here And a commitment to this ministry involves a deep sacrificial commitment to our community and to its people. It also involves an an excellent spirit, a spirit I've been so blessed to see in the lives of so many of you who are gathered in this room and also those who are online with us today. May the Lord honor our attempts as as we uh, try to live out and obey this high calling upon our lives. And may we be encouraged as Christians that we have a firm and secure hope in the person of Jesus Christ. A hope which our community is desperate for and desperately needs. 
we as a body deeply desire to bring the life-changing power of the gospel into every, uh, the life of every one of our neighbors. But, but we know that this is hard, right? It's hard, friends, and we, we know this. Especially it feels hard at this time with COVID-19. And, and so the question is, how are we to do this? And, and how are we to live worthy of the calling to which the Lord has called us to? And it's at this time that I would like to give it over to Zach. And Zach is going to take us into some New Testament passages to further explore these questions um, about the means of being involved in our society and our community. You know, uh, taking off that mask and coming up here kind of felt like I was taking off the warm-ups to get into a big game. This is a little weird. (laughs) But I'm, I'm glad to be here, and good morning to all of you, and I'm glad that you are here with us. Um, This morning, I'd like to tell you a story about how the gospel of Jesus transformed a city. The the city of Colossae was a thriving city. It was on a major trade route through the Lycanus River Valley, and it connected all the surrounding cities. Got it. Um, And around 150 B.C., uh, Rome took over. Laodicea, a nearby city, and they decided to bypass the trade route to avoid Colossae. Now, losing a, a big part of their, uh, losing this trade route was a big part of their economy. And slowly over the years, around the first century AD, Colossae developed into a mostly blue collar city. It was definitely not a destitute city. However, it was not the prime real estate that it once was. Around 60 AD, when Paul wrote the, this letter to, to the church in Colossae, there was a lot of diversity in the city with different nationalities, religions, and cultures. Please turn with me to uh, Colossians 4. There you go. Or you can read it off screen. Um, but... Uh, when Paul wrote this, he was well aware of the demographic, and he, he wanted to incur- encourage the church of Colossae, the people in it, and he wanted to instruct them. So let's, uh, let's read. Gonna, verse 2. Devote yourself to prayer with an alert mind and a thankful heart. Pray for us, too, that God will give us many opportunities to speak about the mysterious plan concerning Christ. And that is why I am here in chains. Pray that I will proclaim this message as clearly as I should. Live wisely among those who are not believers and make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be gracious and attractive, that you will have the right response for everyone. This, uh, this section of the Bible, if you read it in, in one that has headings, it's headed as an encouragement for prayer. And while I, I do see this to be true, I don't think it quite covers what's actually in this passage. So if I were writing the headings today, I I would call this how to effectively do ministry in your community. As we we start to look at these scriptures, I just want to point out that there are six sentences. One of them is about Paul, where he talks about being in chains, and the other five are about them. Should I say the other five are about us? There are five verbs, sorry, (laughs) there are five verbs in these sentences, and these are five things that we should do. There are also five adjectives and adverbs that I would like to point out, and these five things should describe us when we are doing what we should do. So before we talk about what we should do, let's, let's talk about what we should be, and those five things are alert, thankful, Clear, wise, and gracious. Christians, that's you and me, should be alert, thankful, clear, wise, and gracious. Our church is to be alert, thankful, clear, wise, and gracious. I gave you plenty of time to write those down, just so you know. So we are to be alert at every opportunity to share the love of Christ. We're to be thankful 
when we see the Lord working around us. We are to be clear in our message and how we live it out in our lives. And we are to be wise in understanding the, understanding the problems that are faced by our community. And we are to be gracious in how we receive and how we respond to every person. You know what, while studying these verses, they were very convicting. And I started asking myself some questions, and to be open with you, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't a fan of some of the answers. I asked, do people see someone who is alert or someone who is drifting along unmindful of the needs around them? Do they see someone who is thankful or do they see someone who is angry, fearful, and worried? Do they see someone who is clear? Or do they see someone whose actions and words conflict? Do they see someone who is wise? Or someone who appears to be detached and unapproachable? Do they see someone who is gracious? Or do they see someone who is judgmental and quick to dismiss? As I said, reading these verses over and over for this message was just extremely convicting. And my, my hope is that as a church, we can be open with each other and, and honest as we answer these questions for ourselves. So now that we've, we've talked about what we should be, let's, let's move on to what Paul writes we should do. Paul's first point is in verse 2. He tells us to pray. And not just pray, but devote ourselves to praying for the community and the leaders of our community. There are thousands within 10 square miles of here that don't know the love that Jesus has for them. There are people suffering and being marginalized. There are families being torn apart. People that are making awful decisions that are going to affect the rest of their lives. And the sad part is, they may not know any better. They may never have had friends that spoke truth into their lives. They may never have had anyone praying for them. They need prayer. Are we aware of what's going on in our community? Are we praying for the people in it? Paul's second point comes from verse 3. After he tells us to pray, he tells us to pray more. And he tells us to center our ministry around God. We need, to, we need to pray for opportunities to speak about Jesus with people. I really love how Paul is encouraging them to be humble and that, to remember that, that he gives them the opportunity to speak about Jesus with people. You know, Stephen and I, we, we lead Young Life together at Perry Hall High School. And when we, when we go to the school, we take time to pray. Because if we don't pray and we don't involve God in our ministry and what we're doing, I mean, the, the reality is we're, we're just two men with beards trying to hang out with high schoolers. Yeah, and to be honest, it's a lot more awkward than it sounds. And I think it proves that, that God is the backbone of any ministry. You know, Jesus says in John 15 that without me you can do nothing. Not without me you can do much, but without me you can do nothing. And Paul, sa Paul states it very simply, simply for himself. Pray that God give him the opportunities. And so I want to take, take this for myself and for the ministry that, that, that we're involved in. And, and I ask you all to do the same. We need to pray that God gives us the opportunity to earn the right to speak about Jesus with people. In verse 5, Paul states that, that we need to live wisely among those who are not believers. You know, Stephen touched on it a little bit. And we also talked about being wise earlier. So I, I'd like to, to bring your focus on the words that immediately follow. Among. Among those who do not believe. It's, it's a whole lot easier for God to give us the opportunity 
if we are already among those he is longing for. Paul is instructing them to be a part of their community, to befriend their neighbors and their co-workers, to be involved in local non-church related events, to let their faces be shown and known. He states that they should make the most of every opportunity. He wants the church in Colossae to look at every day, every interaction, every seemingly insignificant moment as, a, as an opportunity to make the most of. And for us, it is the same some 2,000 plus years later. But to again be open with you, for me, this is not the easiest thing to do. I don't know about you, but for me, it's not. Uh, it's really easy to read on the page, but it's, it's a lot harder to do. You know, after a stressful day at work, all, all I want to do is go home, hang out with Maddie, watch some TV, play some Xbox, and, and just check out. But you know, Paul never checked out. And he didn't write anything in Colossians about checking out. And Jesus never checks out. Jesus did all of these things. He prayed and then he prayed more. He lived among unbelievers. He hung out with tax collectors and sinners. From the very beginning of his ministry, he was walking along the Sea of Galilee and he saw two brothers, Andrew and Peter. Andrew and Peter, and they were throwing nets into the water because they were fishermen by trade. And Jesus called out to them. He said, come and follow me, and I will show you how to fish for people. And they left their nets, and they followed him. You know, Jesus went to where Peter and Andrew worked. He went to the place that they knew that they would be. He initiated the conversation. He spoke truth into their lives, and he invited them in. I really really enjoy this passage, and I can relate to it. Because people that are sitting right here from this very church did the same thing for me. Paul's next point in, in verse 6. To let our conversation be gracious and attractive so that you will have the right response for everyone. I think that, uh, that most people strive for this. You know, having gracious and attractive conversation and having the right response for everyone. Um, but I don't, I don't think Paul's calling us to be any sort of super theologian to have all the answers, but what he is doing is calling us to be genuine, to be kind, and to be caring for the people that we meet. And to do this is, is a huge step in having the right response. You know, we, ha we have a responsibility as God's ambassador, ambassadors to represent truth and represent who Jesus is. We, we do that by, by how we respond. How we respond to hard questions and hard times. How we respond to social problems and injustices. And how we respond to the concerns of the people in the world that don't believe. Paul is writing this to a church in a blue-collar city populated with people of different backgrounds and cultures and beliefs. You know, Paul could be writing to Baltimore. This, this letter could be addressed right here to the believers at Forge Road. So, why, why did Paul write these reminders in Colossians? I, I think that because it's because they're they're really easy to forget. I think that it's, it's easy for us to get wrapped up in our own lives and only hang out with people who believe similar things, who have similar political views, who go to the same school or church, or even look similar. You know, in, in this time period in Colossae, the racial tension was heavy. Greeks looked down upon the Jews. Jews looked down on Gentiles. 
The, the circumcised thought that they had a better standing with God than the uncircumcised, and, and everyone looked down upon the barbarians and the foreigners. Maybe this was what was on Paul's mind. Maybe this was what was on Paul's mind when he, wrote, when he writes in chapter 3, and put on your new self who is being renewed to a true knowledge of the one according to the image of the one who created him. A renewal in which there is no distinction between Greek and Jew, circumcised, uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, and freeman. But Christ is all and in all. Paul is clear that all races, cultures, and social classes are equal in Christ. And more than equal but one. He's clear that the church is the place where this should be made the most clear. You know, the the culture around us can make any and all distinctions. It always has, and it certainly does today. But we as Christians have an obligation to make sure that no one feels marginalized or out of place when among us. But it requires huge sacrifice. I, I want you all to consider for a minute what Paul is telling the Jewish Christians to do. They believed their whole life that they needed to to obey the law exactly, to observe all the festivals and the rituals, and to, to get circumcised. And anyone who didn't do this could not know God and could not be a part of the church. Their traditions were locked in. They just they just did things a certain way. But if they truly wanted to make their Gentile and barbarian Christian brothers and sisters feel welcomed, they were going to have to be willing to accept and make new traditions. They would have to lay down their pride in order to make a church where their brothers and sisters of a different background or culture could worship and praise and be encouraged in the Lord. And it was probably really uncomfortable and difficult at first. But no matter how hard it was, by the Spirit of God, they were able to do it. You know, as I mentioned earlier, there, there were just there were people from this chapel that are here today that poured themselves out and sacrificed so that I could know who Jesus is. You know, Jesus changed my life. You all changed my life. And we as a church and as individuals have an abundance of opportunity around us to introduce people in our community to Jesus. No matter Greek, Jew, circumcised, uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, foreigner, white, black, addicted, disabled, hurting, angry, or anyone else that you meet. So let us pray for our community and for the people in it, as we should. Let us value every life and value their salvation, as we should. Let us make the most of every opportunity to be involved in our community and the people in it, as the Bible calls us to do. Let us make sacrifices in order for someone of a different race, culture, or background to be able to worship the one true God as Paul instructs. Let us have our conversation always be gracious and attractive as the Spirit would show us. Let us focus on our purpose to be able to proclaim the love of God through our words and through our lives as Jesus did. Just thank you for being here or for listening on Zoom. You know, may, the, may the Lord bless us with a vision and with an abundance of opportunity to minister to people in our community. I'm going to pray to end the meeting. Well, we just thank you so much for everyone here and for just your spirit moving and for the word that you gave us. We just uh, pray that, that we can, we pray for our community, we pray for the leaders in it. We pray that, that they can come to know you like we know you. Lord, we just we love you and we thank we thank you that you love every soul. We just pray this all in your name.
Amen.